Welcome to the Superstar Communicator Podcast. My name is Susan Heaton Wright, a leading impact speaking and communications expert. My aim is to show you how to make an impact so you will be heard, listened to, and respected for career success. Listen weekly to the podcast and go to our website, superstarcommunicator.com. Hello, everybody. This is Susan Heaton Wright from Superstar Communicator. We're at the beginning of a new year. What last year was quite incredible, wasn't it? And we have to focus forward to move forward. And I have got the perfect guest today. He is Jeff Schwartz, and he is the author of Work Disrupted. He's a founding partner of Deloitte Consultants US Future of Work Practice and the global editor since 2011 of the Global Human Capital Trends Report. Jeff has led research on the evolution of work, workforces and workplace practices and advise clients around the world on workforce transformation. A global consultant, Jeff has lived and worked in the United States, India, Russia, Belgium, Kenya, and Israel. He's a graduate of the Yale School of Management and Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. And he currently resides in New York City. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Susan. Delighted to be with you today. Really excited. Me too. And, you know, tell us about your book, Work Disrupted. Well, I've been working on this book for about seven years. Um, and I think the, the, I was very fortunate. I think the timing of bringing it out now as we're pivoting from, hopefully pivoting from 2020, the year of COVID, uh, to 2021, um, the year of opportunity and possibility, and we'll we'll talk about that. And the, the the inspiration for this book, just to start our discussion, and really the the stories that we tell in the book, work disrupted, are really inspired by an idea that I think is well summarized by Albert Einstein. And I don't think you can go wrong by 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 quoting Albert Einstein, one of the most brilliant people of all time, who said that. You can't use an old map to explore a new world. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the challenge that we're facing right now, and we're, it's really quite intensely in front of us as we're starting 2021, is how do we make sense and navigate 21st century careers, 21st century work, but not use 20th century maps? Right, and that's where we find ourselves. We're using old maps for new problems. And that's really what we go into in the book, which is how has the world changed and what mental models and maps will really help us navigate the world that we're in today. That is so true. We are in a situation where there are some people who genuinely believe that when everyone gets the vaccine, if they decide to have it, that we will just go back to the world that we were in before. What would you say to that? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's it, uh, well, I, I think there are people that are talking about going back, but I don't think that, I don't think people are talking about going back to the world that we had before. In fact, Susan, I hope that they're not. Yes. It's interesting. Um, uh, again, because it's early 2021, we get to reflect on the last year. And one of the discussions I've been having uh, with colleagues around the world is, what does the 2020 word cloud look like, right? And look, COVID-19 and pandemic are, are pretty much front and center, and they are the big fonts in this picture. But there are other words that resilience is a pretty big word Definitely. in the word cloud of 2020. And acceleration and digital acceleration is another. But I think that what we're seeing now, and this is where the question of, are we going back to something? Was 2020 a detour? Was it a side route? Um, or was it an on-ramp to something new? I obviously think it's an on-ramp to something new. And of course, in 
2020 and 21 acceleration is critical to what we're seeing. But the world is not only going faster, it's actually been disrupted. And there's a, a wonderful quote that I think has been very well circulated, at least, at least in the US and I hope in the UK and the rest of the world, from Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the president of, the, of New America. It's a foundation in the think tank here in the US. And Anne-Marie wrote in late March of, of last year that the coronavirus is a time machine to the future. And, and to me, that's a really interesting image when we think about work disrupted. To me, that's an interesting image when we think about work disrupted and whether or not we're going back or we're going ahead. Because for better or worse, and I think largely better, we experienced in 2020 some really interesting elements of the future. And we did it really fast. And we heard this from many, many people, right? What we thought would take five years would take five weeks, or in some cases, five days. We moved 1.6 billion students around the world to remote learning. Yes. It wasn't perfect. There were pluses and minuses. We can talk about that if it's of interest to you and your, your listeners, but, but we did it. We moved 50% in the US. We went from 5% of the workforce working from home to 50% of the people that could work at home, working remotely and working at home. And we did it fast. And we, we've, because we've had the experience of the future, right? We've tasted the future. It's very hard to go back. And I think the challenge for all of us now as individuals, as business leaders, as citizens, is to think about what do we wanna do with the future? It's really a question I talk about preferred futures. And now that we have a sense of it, where do we wanna take it? So I don't think it's about going back. I think that's really, really interesting because a number of people that are, are business owners like me who have really done well this year, they have found, and, and I put myself in that category, we have found ways to use digital to move our businesses forward and seen the benefits of it. And we can see what the old world is like, you know, the old world, if you understand what I mean by that. And in the future, we know that we can incorporate the best bits of the old world with what we have experienced this year. Have, has that been the feedback that you have received from the many conversations you've had? Well, to be, to be fair, right? Um, it, it has been uneven. Yes. Right? And, and um, uh, on the one hand, for those of us who work in the knowledge economy, who work in, we used to call it white collar, but I'm not sure, but I think it gives an idea of the, yeah. the kind of work we're talking about. Um, I think the opportunity to move to remote and virtual environments was very, very powerful. And there were some real benefits. It's still being debated, but I, I think by and large, and certainly from my perspective and observations, um, for many workers who moved to remote and virtual work, um, there were some, some amazing positives. We actually saw productivity go up. And we also saw people working more hours, which is sort of interesting yeah. um, as well. And, and there's some very interesting data on working more hours. But we also had some interesting data in the second quarter of the year last year and the third quarter where productivity went up. And that, that's very interesting. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. I think we also saw a very interesting integration of work and life. Um, in some of the research that we do uh, in Deloitte Consulting, we put out an annual report on human capital trends. And we actually put out um, our 2021 report in December, just a few weeks ago. And um, we really talk about this pivot. We talk about moving from survive to thrive. Yes. Um, and the environment we're in. But one of the, and one of the things we talk about is the integration of well being into work. Yes. And well-being, you know, historically, traditionally has been seen as a set of programs on the side of work, right? You get healthcare benefits, you have access to a gym, if you're fortunate, you have access to um, other types of services. I think one of the things that we all witnessed and experienced during COVID-19 was the critical importance of integrating well-being in our work and our lives. 
we're recording this in, in uh, early in the year. We're doing it in each other's living rooms. I don't know where you are. I'm, I'm, I'm at the dining room table here in my apartment. <laughs> I'm in, in my little office. <laughs> in in, uh, in uh, Manhattan. And, you know, I, I haven't seen the, the tail of a cat or a dog walk across, but, you know, that's the way that we work. I'm hoping, and I think we're all hoping, that part of what we take forward from the COVID experience, this time machine into the future, are things that worked for us. And the integration of work and life, the focus on well-being, the focus on health and mental health, although it was a trying time, I think really is something that we can bring forward as we're looking at what happens next. And that's the type of thing that we go into in detail in that 2021 report. Now, we, we, we talked about remote working and the benefits of that, and obviously that's digital. But I know that a number of clients that I work with are very worried about AI taking over their jobs. What's your opinion about that? Well, it's a, it's a great question, Susan. And I, as I mentioned, as we were getting started, I've been working on this book for seven years. I, I wrote one of my first articles with some of my colleagues here um, in 2013 on the open talent economy. We were looking at uh, the, the gig worker and the crowd worker. Yes. Um, but then in 2015, we wrote an article that I think speaks to this question. The title of the article was Machines as Talent. Machines is actually part of the workforce. And I think the question that I am most often asked by both clients and by podcast interviewers <laughs> and by friends and colleagues is, are robots and is AI coming for our jobs? Is the future about the robot apocalypse or is the future about humanity unleashed. And there are some strong perspectives on, on both sides. My view, having looked at this uh, very seriously um, for, for many years, is that this really is a question of opportunity. Um, that's not to say that there aren't going to be a lot of changes, because there will be. The way that I like to think about, the way I like to frame it, and really this book, Susan, is about reframing the way we think about work, <laughs> careers, and, and yeah. management and organizations, is that we will all be working, if we're not already, with and next to smart machines and robots. That will be the nature of all of our work. We will work with smart machines and robots as tools. We will work with them as assistants. We will work with them as colleagues. And in some cases, they will tell us what to do. By the way, this model is from, is from Tom Malone, a professor at MIT, who talks about the four relationships that we have with technology. But what's interesting about it is the opportunity to think about how we can form teams of people and machines, including AI, obviously, to do things that we couldn't do before. And I'll, I'll, I have many examples, but I'll give one of, one of, my, one of my favorites which is from uh, Dr. Eric Topol. Dr. Topol wrote a wonderful book called Deep Medicine. It's on the impact and role of AI in medicine. Uh, fantastic read, brilliant, brilliant uh, professor. And um, he uses the example of radiology. And, and this has been something that's been looked at in a fair amount of, of business literature. AI algorithms are really good at reading digital scans that are taken and traditionally read by radiologists. In fact, today, at least the reports that I read say that the, uh, a really good AI algorithm and reader is better than, I don't know, 75 or 80% of a typical human reading a scan. Wow. And there's, there was a really interesting debate about this, which is, so does that mean that we're going to need fewer radiologists? Yeah. And what, what Dr. Topol say and others say is no, We'll probably need more radiologists with different skills, but the work and the job of a radiologist changes. And he uses a wonderful phrase, and he says, we need to become Renaissance radiologists. And we'll, we'll take this phrase in a second. And a Renaissance radiologist, think of all the great Renaissance inventors, stands on the shoulders of the technology. She or he uses the technology to, to do a first pass, to gather information. They can use crowds and, and work with other doctors and other machines to get some of the information to do better diagnostics. 
so that what the doctor can do, what the Renaissance radiologist can do is what Eric Topol calls deep care. Because deep care is what machines cannot do, right? right? Deep care and the interaction with the patient and understanding um, uh, what the um, uh, challenges are in the diagnosis and how to take care of themselves and interacting with the family and interacting with other um, caregivers are the things that doctors and, and clinicians can uniquely do. So I think the two lessons I take from that are one, and we talk about this in the book, we talk about this in our research, we need to be thinking about super jobs and super teams, right? Jobs and teams where we will be using AI and robots. We need to change the work that we do. And whatever you do, you have an opportunity to become the Renaissance version of that. The version of your work that combines people and technology together. You know, that is such a beautiful response. I, uh, you know, th I think for me being a very empathetic person and um, training lots of people in interpersonal skills, I'm reassured by that they, because you are all, all uh, you are still um, highlighting the human superpower which is interactive skills with each other and being able to understand each other, but to be able to um, send off information that AI can do so that we can focus on this, on being human. Susan, I, I think that's spot on. And, it, and it's interesting. I, uh, I, again, I don't wanna be painted as being too optimistic about the future because there are some real challenges. And we talk about that in the book, of course, as well. But, but I do think in some sense, the future is about superpowers. I really like that you've brought up that idea. And one of the things that we delve into and others do as well is understanding and exploring as our work and our jobs and our careers change, what are the things that we uniquely can do as humans? And what are the things we can uniquely do as teams of people and uniquely do with teams of people and technology. So we go into really good detail. We cover from different perspectives. What are the enduring human capabilities, right? You've talked about empathy and listening and social skills and problem solving um, and communications and teaming and coordination and management, which are uniquely human things. But the thing that I'll add to that, and this is something that I think helps frame the superpower question, is superpowers to what end? The future of work to achieve what purpose? And, and we talk about this actually at the very beginning of the book and uh, throughout some chapters at the end, because one of the really interesting questions, and there are many in the future of work, is what are we trying to accomplish? And uh, Unfortunately, or I, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but I think maybe the we can reach farther than we have so far, is a lot of the work that we've done with robotics and AI has been focused on what might be referred to or summarized as automation or replacement or substitution strategies. How do we take the human element out? Can we identify the tasks that are part okay. of your job that a machine can do? Um, and substitution, um, and taking out human labor, you know, can lead to cost efficiencies. In some cases, it does. But the objective of business, and I, I want to make sure everybody hears the first and the second part of my comment, is not just to lower cost and to be more efficient. That we know that value in business is a function of creating new value, creating new products, creating new experiences, serving new customers, um, creating new industries, creating new ways of operating. I mean, the economics on this, I mean, Robert Sola won a Nobel Prize for it, which is it's innovation that creates value. And the reason I, 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 I take a second to talk about this, Susan, is sometimes we get, I think, overly excited. We vector almost too much on the role of AI and robotics to help make us more efficient and to optimize what we're doing when the real opportunity is to create value. And value is fr comes from innovation, it comes from building new relationships, it comes from customer experience, and you can see the relationship between these sources of value, not only from people, but people and humans play a major role in it, right? So if the work is repeatable, it's probably not gonna be 
you know, a, a critical part of your work going forward, unless it involves some degree of intense human interaction. But this importance of value and meaning and impact, I think is another really important part of this work disrupted story. Oh, that's reassuring for many of the listeners, I'm sure, who are working on their human superpowers of that. Now, um, we will ask, I will ask you a question about um, career ladders and traditional ones a bit later, okay. but we know that you and I have both had quite um, a journey in our careers. Um, as I mentioned to you before the interview started, I worked in Kenya. Um, I used to be a professional opera singer. I've worked in India as well and various other countries. And that has made me, me, with the experiences that I have. And I know you have had some extraordinary experiences that have got you to where you are now. I'm sure the listeners want to find out a little bit more. So someone, I love this question, Susan, and thank you for asking it. Someone asked me recently, um, what's my superpower? <laughs> um, and you have to think about that for a second because you, you, you know, you're not really sure what, what is my superpower. But I, I think that one of my superpowers, if I can put it this way, is my curiosity and sense of adventure. And um, if you have that, and if you encourage it, and if you encourage it in yourself and your colleagues and your children um, and your friends and your relatives, amazing things happen yes. um, in your lives. We, we know now, and we'll come back to this as she said in a second, we know that our lives are not linear. We know that life is a journey. We know, we literally, I think, have a, a section of the book called The Long and Winding Career, like The Long and Winding Road. I'm dating myself here for people who don't know the Beatles songs. But, um, and, and for people who've had those various experiences, and for me, you know, I studied intellectual history um, in college, as I like to say, the most useful of undergraduate degrees, <laughs> sort of a, a rough equivalent of PPE as, as you have in... Uh, <laughs> In the UK, but we didn't have it in the US, so I, I had to figure out some version of it um, on my own. And I, I worked for a foundation in Washington, the Robert Kennedy Memorial Foundation, studying youth policy, the impact of federal government programs on youth. I found my way into the US Peace Corps, where I was. I lived in a village in Nepal, learned Nepalese in 11 weeks, taught math and science in a village. That was a day walk from the road, and it was a day walk whether you felt like doing a day walk or not. Um, yep. um, and, you know, moved on, lived on a kibbutz, worked on a political campaign, got two graduate degrees, as you mentioned, went to business school and graduate school in economics and, and you know, had a career largely in consulting. But as hopefully many of your listeners know, um, consultants don't do the same thing for more than five minutes. <laughs> um, um, so I've been, I've led multiple practices. I've been able to live in the U S Brussels, Russia, Israel, um, and India. Um, and, and I think that exposure has been incredibly, uh, stimulating for me, but in an interesting way, I think that we're seeing the importance of experience and opportunity and choice and agency which is what I've just sort of summarized by talking about what I did over 30 years, is something that is really moving to the center of what is going to happen in 21st century careers. And the, the, the way that I would uh, sort of tell, uh, tell this, talk about this transition is, we used to think about careers literally in what was called the three box model. You get training, for the first 20 years, 20 years of your life, you work for 25 years and then you retire. <laughs> um, and that's it. And, and, when the, and the work that you do, your career, it's linear, it's prescribed. You have a job description. Your job description tells you what to do. It tells you when to do it. It tells you who you report to. And your career ladder is a set of planned out moves that are highly sequential, even in adjacency, is very, very close to where you started. You have a career in finance, career in supply chain. What we're seeing now is, is really the introduction of marketplaces and ecosystems. I think this is one of the really interesting things happening 
in careers now, um, which is that companies are setting up marketplaces so that people who are looking to run projects or parts of the company are literally posting them and people within the company are applying and getting matched sometimes with AI to do that. And so careers look more like the expression I use is portfolios of lifelong reinvention or to put it into a visual image. And we have a wonderful cartoon of this in the book. We used to talk about career ladders and yes. one of my partners um, who retired a couple of years ago, she's on the board of Nike, Kathy Benko, wrote a book on mass career customization and another on the corporate lattice. Really the image that it's not, careers aren't ladders. You can go in any direction and at any speed. And the image that one of our clients uses is that careers aren't ladders. A career looks like a jungle gym. Yeah. Right? And, and you know, um, there's no order in a jungle gym. You can go up, down, in and out at different speeds in different directions. There's a lot of choice for those of us who are in the middle of this jungle gym of opportunity. And this is, the reason I love this question is, this is one of the big shifts. This is one of the, a really good example of a mental model and a new map. Because if your map of a career is get training, get a job, follow a, prescri a prescribed career path and retire, you are not necessarily setting yourself up for a 21st century career. Our lives are gonna be longer, our, our friends Linda Gratton and Andrew Scott at London Business School wrote their wonderful books, The 100 Year Life and The New Long Life. If, if you live to be 100, you could work for 50 or 60 years. Yes. The average time in a job is three or four years. The half-life of a skill is less than five. The average person may have what looks like 14 career jumps in their lives. It's about lifelong chapters of reinvention. And that's a big shift for us as individuals. It's a big educational challenge, and it's obviously a challenge for us in the corporate sector. Oh, absolutely. Now, just by sheer chance, later this month, I've been invited to go back to my old university as a, an alumna um, to talk to the students at my old college about career, because my career has not been a straight line. Any tips that you can share with me so that I can tell them? <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I, it's a great question. It's a great, it's a great opportunity. It is, um, isn't it? Mm. And, and a real honor. I, would, I might start, I, one thing you might do in that discussion is start with some questions of the students as to what their view of a career is. Yes. How do they think about it? Because I, I don't think, and this is part, I'll say, of the opportunity of the disconnect. I don't think that, I think we're talking about Generation Z now, but I don't think the Generation Z <laughs> thinks about careers in the same way that boomers do, and I'm a boomer, or, or Generation X. I, um, I don't think they're yeah, bought into the idea that a career is you get training, you get a job, you retire. I, I think they have a much more fluid view of what it looks like. So it'd be interesting to, to get a sense as to how do they think about careers? And I think it's a, it, another question you might ask, if you really, I'd love to hear this discussion, is how do they think about the difference between a full-time job and being a gig worker or a freelance worker? Because one of the things we talk about in the book, it's something we're seeing, it's a big part of the the work disrupted, the future of work landscape, is the, the tremendous growth of different types of employment models. Yes. Um, obviously, we're all accustomed to the idea that a job might be a full-time employment offer or a part-time employment offer, but you could be a managed services employee, work for one company providing services to another. You could be an independent freelancer. You could be a gig worker. You could be a crowd worker. These are all different ways of working. Yeah. And, and as I talk with younger generations of workers, they seem on one level to be more comfortable that maybe they'll be an employee and maybe they'll be an independent worker, but they're less concerned about it. So I'd be interested to hear, uh, you should come, please come back to me after you go oh, back yes. to the college <laughs> or university and let me know what you hear. <laughs> I, I think it is very interesting because I was a musician before, I've had a portfolio career for a number of years, so that's felt a little bit more comfortable. But certainly my parents, 
and teachers would advise me to have that career ladder. So it, it's, I, I always felt um, that there was that dichotomy around my career, that it couldn't be measured in the same way. Well, it's interesting. Um, well, it, it's interesting because this, that observation really underscores um, one of the comments, at least I think it's true that we made when we got started, which is that we can't use old maps to explore new worlds. Um, and um, I think it actually makes it harder for us emotionally and in terms of um, making the decisions that we need to make when we're carrying and trying to use these, these old maps for what a, a career um, looks like. And I, this, these are, this is probably the biggest shift that we're going through right now is adopting to these new um, uh, mental models. And it's a big issue for not just parents and kids. I have two daughters, 26 and 29. Um, so I'm watching them build their own resilient um, lives and their own resilient careers. But it's a challenge for business leaders and business managers who have been educated and schooled and, and incented for many decades to use 20th century management rule books. And, and um, one of the really interesting sections of the book looks explicitly at um, uh, what does resilient forward-looking leadership and management look like? Leadership's the most written about topic in, in oh business. Oh my goodness, so I'm, yes. so I'm, gonna I'm, not, I'm not pretending to have, you know, any tremendous insights on it. But, um, you know, we start the chapter with the story of, of Daniel Kahneman, the behavioral economist. Uh, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics. And as he'll be among the first to comment, that's interesting because he's never taken an economics class in his life. He's a psychologist. And, and he's always been a psychologist. And what he studies is problems through a psychological lens. But what, what one of the things that he did, and Amos Tversky and, and, and uh, the people who created behavioral economics, is they helped us understand that human behavior really needs to be much more at the center of management practice and management economics, right? That it wasn't only your necessarily mathematical formulas um, that mattered, right? It wasn't control and getting everything in the right column and the right and aligned in the right way. It was understanding human behavior. So we talk about in in the book, leading as psychologists, leading as coaches, leading as designers. We need to design the future almost as much, maybe more than we need to manage it. We need to build teams. We need to coach performance and fuel performance as much as we need to measure it. And you can see the sort of the from to discussion we're having here. Right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've written some notes here about <laughs> leadership styles and the traditional autocratic, <laughs> which clearly does not work with the new world. It doesn't work. And I think it also relates to the discussion we have around how organizational models are shifting. And again, the whole I, I just love this idea and I, I find it very invigorating, and I hope your listeners are, uh, can experiment with it as well, is to think about what are the mental models that people are using? And are there different maps that we can apply? One is, how do we think about the organization and the company itself? Um, when you think about an organization, you think about an organization chart, right? And you think about lines and boxes and levels um, and then you think about silos and turf wars and <laughs> all sorts of other problems. Um, but we don't work in organization charts. We work in teams. Yes. Right. And those teams are connected in networks. And those networks are increasingly run off platforms. So what we're talking about is what does it mean to create an organization that's organized around teams, that's organized around networks, that's organized around markets, that's organized around ecosystems, and not necessarily organized around hierarchy and functional alignment and compliance and supervision. So just a, another, hopefully a very good image of sort of an old set of maps and mindsets and a new set of maps and mindsets. That reassures me because one of the, one of the sort of questions I had scribbled down here was that 
Um, a challenge I feel for people often is that if they're in middle management, they feel um, detached from the leadership uh, discussions that are going on when in fact they are leading a team. Well, I think that's right. And I think we're seeing in, in almost every kind of organization and company um, a shift from process-based work, um, uh, manufacturing line-based work, even in manufacturing, to much more team-based work and project-based work. And in team-based work and project-based work, I'm in management consulting, everything we do is project and team-based. So the most powerful, influential, and engaged, I hope, managers in our organization are people you would think of as middle managers. These are the managers and senior managers. They're not necessarily the partners or the managing directors that run the projects. They run yes. the teams, yes. right? They do the work. I mean, that's our unit of work is a team. And when the middle managers are team leaders, as you suggested, it's a very different dynamic because the team is where the work happens. Yeah. The team is the center of action. And, and, that, and when middle managers are team leaders, when middle managers are coaches and designers of the work, it's a very different dynamic, hopefully. So everybody that is involved in um, career structure and leadership teams, try to encourage those middle managers to adopt this or to provide training and support so that they can do this. Absolutely. I, I'm really enjoying this discussion, but I know that you haven't got all day. I'm sure you've got lots of other interviews, but before we finish, I always ask my guests for three quick top tips to work in 2021 and onwards. So, it's, it's hard to ask an author who spent seven years writing a book. Sorry. No, 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 no. To come up with three, but I've been asked this question a few times. So I should, I should have a, I, I hopefully I have a, a good answer. Um, and it really is, it's structured the way that, that we've put the book together. The first is really focus on opportunity. Yes. Focus on the opportunities to do work that creates value not just reduces costs. Obviously we wanna reduce costs, we have to do that, but our, yeah. the opportunity to create value and the opportunity for people and machines to work together. The opportunity to leverage and create opportunity for people who are full-time employees and different employees. And, and one of the things we didn't spend, uh, we talked a little bit about is, and the opportunities to make hybrid work, flexible work. Um, um, most organizations in 2021 um, are planning some version of, you know, two, three, four days in the office, one, two, three days working from home. Take the opportunity to really explore how to make that work and benefit from what we, we, we learned in 2020. The second is to focus on resilience. And, mm -hmm. you know, resilience is both, uh, we're going to test our grammar skills here now, Susan. It's both an adjective and a noun. I mean, it's something, we, what, we, what I'm really encouraging people to do is to actually build resilience, right? Build the capabilities as an individual um, um, so that you can have a, um, a resilient career. A resilient career is built for multiple chapters. It's built around the idea that a resilient person will reinvent themselves many times. So take the time to build those skills. Think about a resilient organization. How are you bringing, as we've just discussed, teams into the work that you're doing? How are you bringing networks into it? And then finally, how are you bringing resilience into management? Are you managing for 21st century realities, coaching, fueling performance, designing the future, or are you measuring and monitoring it and supervising it? And then, and then finally, um, we talked about opportunity, we talked about resilience focus on growth, right? The future is about growth, whether it's an individual, a business, or, or a community, right? right? Think about what you can do in 2021 to grow. We talk uh, throughout the book about the growth mindset, Carol Dweck's work, absolutely central to the idea of growing in, uh, in the 21st century. Um, we talk about the opportunity for leaders to grow their businesses by focusing on value creation and partnering with the people in the organization. 
and then to grow our social and our community environments, um, there's a big there's a big challenge that we have, not just as workers and students and family members, but as citizens and community members all over the world to think about how we can reset public agendas for education, for the social contract, for the environment. I don't want to reach too far here, but, but um, um, you know, part of the future of work is inventing the future as individuals and business leaders and citizens and members of community. So um, hopefully people get a little bit of energy from the discussion that, I'm, that I feel in discussing it with you, Susan. So thank you for the, for the time today. Oh, but before we go, yes. and it has been a, a fantastic interview, you must let everybody know how they can get hold of your book. Well, you can get the book through a variety of ways. You can, um, hopefully you can put into a search engine, which for most of us is Google, um, uh, work disrupted, uh, the words work disrupted in Deloitte, and it will take you to Deloitte.com's website. Um, which is probably the best place to go because that lists the different vendors that you can go to. It's uh, I mean, thanks to our marketing team. Um, it's on amazon.com. It's on walmart.com. It's on barnesandnoble.com. I, I know you're in, um, uh, you're recording from the UK. I think it's on, who's the big, Waterstones? We're going to get it wrong. Who's Waterstones, the, yes. Waterstones, I think it's on Waterstones website as well. So um, I think it's going to be coming out um, uh, late January, early February. It'll be available in the UK. It's available um, uh, very early in the year here um, in the US and other places in the world. So uh, work disrupted Deloitte.com and look forward to people not only ordering the book, but look forward to people providing um, reviews and comments and really continuing what I think is a very important conversation. Definitely. And how, if, if somebody wants to contact you, is it okay to contact you via LinkedIn? Do you mind that? Uh, absolutely. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm Jeff Schwartz um, on LinkedIn. If you put in Jeff Schwartz Deloitte, you will, you will find uh, my LinkedIn profile. You'll also find some, some of the social media that we did about the, uh, that we did for the book. And one of the things I did mention is um, the book is illustrated by Tom Fishburne, who goes by the Marketoonist, who, as far as I know, Tom's one of the only business cartoonists who went to Harvard Business School. Um, there are 25 um, original cartoons around these topics uh, of work disrupted and the accelerated future of work. And some of those cartoons are on LinkedIn and on the social, on social media. So that'll be fun for people to look at as well. Oh, brilliant. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. This has been a brilliant conversation. And um, certainly I'm feeling far more reassured about 2021 and onwards. So am I. And um, thank you for your time and your inspiration and your knowledge. Thank you, Susan. Good luck and good luck to your listeners. And um, here's to a great 2021. Exactly. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Remember, I really, really appreciate any feedback or reviews on all of the main podcast platforms. So until next time, this is Susan Heaton Wright from Superstar Communicator. You have been listening to the Superstar Communicator podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and review the podcast on iTunes and on apps. Please contact us if you want to discuss any topic, could suggest a topic for us to include, or a guest who could come onto the podcast. Go to superstarcommunicator.com.